A seaway that divided North America for a period of 40 million years. How could this be? We will follow in the footsteps of geologists visiting key locations that they studied and learn how they came to the surprising conclusion that there was this great seaway. Furthermore, we will discover why it existed and why it's no longer present, and interestingly, its association to spectacular native ruins and great herds of American bison. Hello, I'm Myron Cook. The natural world around us is very stable with few exceptions. The shapes and sizes of the mountains and the lakes and the oceans and prairies, etc. all change imperceptibly during our lifetimes. But yet when we study the history, the geologic history of the Earth, we find that the planet is continually changing and through time undergoes amazing transformations. This seaway, the Cretaceous Interior Seaway as it's named, is one of those. I know that many of you are wondering how geologists know this seaway even existed. I hope to answer that question for you. Let's start this journey by going to a small reservoir that has had most of the water drained out of to do some repairs on the dam. This provides me with a great opportunity to explain a concept that geologists use to demonstrate the existence and geometry of ancient oceans and lakes. Uh, this mud, all this mud, this is all mud. It's filled in since 1938, about 20 feet of it or so in this area. So you can see how quickly it's filling in. And it's some of this information that helps us understand how geologists find these ancient seaways. Let's go to the whiteboard and we'll talk about this a little more. Uh, this is a cross-sectional view, so I need to draw my tree. I'll do that right here so we know for sure we're in a cross-sectional view looking sideways. And what I'm trying to depict with my artwork here is the dam over here, uh, the water that's being held back by the dam, of course, uh, the natural lake that's forming, or it's actually a reservoir, it's not natural, uh, but underneath is the bedrock, and then through time it's filling in with mud primarily. Uh, near shore you can have some sand, so up near the shore where it's filling in you can get coarser material, but in general through time it just starts filling in with mud. We'll just say mud. In we go. Oh, filling it on in. Now here you're always going to have a low area because the water's exiting out of the bottom of the dam. So you'll always have some small pool of water here by the dam even as this fills up. That's just another story to be talked about later. But I want you to think about something. Let's imagine millions of years in the future that the geology, the, the geolo as the geology has changed. It's changed so much that deposits, the oceans have come in and started putting deposits, layers of rock on top of all this. Yes, even covering our wonderful dam here. <laughs> and there we have it in the future. And then millions of years later, erosion starts cutting back into here and eroding this out. So this is typical in geologic history, by the way. We can erode a big canyon down in here and, and erode into here. And eventually, we will erode and reveal some of the muds that are in this reservoir. So imagine this geologist millions of years from now. <laughs> uh, he's hiking around in a canyon and he sees mud deposits or shale or mudstone, actually, they would be in the future. And he, go, and he starts thinking about, well, this is a change in the character of the rock. I don't have uh, mudstone above or below under here. And he starts to map this body out of, of shale and mudstone. And or you can imagine even easier to imagine are a whole bunch of wells that are drilled and they're and they're recording what they find. It's not hard to imagine that if you have enough information through drill holes or or canyons that have eroded in here, etc., that you could map out the shape of this small reservoir that I'm standing in millions of years into the future. 
And this is one of the tools that geologists use to map out ancient seaways. It's as simple as that. They go around mapping different layers of rock. And in this case, it would be a layer of shale or mudstone. And they put it all together and they start to see the shape of the ancient sea or lake or whatever it might be. It could be an ancient dune field if you're looking at different rocks, you know, wind-blown dune fields, etc. So with that, let's take a long drive to Utah. I want to show you something. Hiking within view of the magnificent Henry Mountains on this chilly, breezy morning, I reflect on the processes and time required for this beautiful landscape to form. I also reflect on the historic 1869 river trip that John Wesley Powell took down the mighty Colorado River investigating the geology of the region. He was the first non-native to set eyes on these mountains. I'm in southeast Utah near Capitol Reef National Monument and I am standing in the mud that was deposited in this great seaway. Um, and I forgot my hammer, but if I just kick around in here, just with my shoes, just a little, I can get nice shale here, nice mud. And that was what was deposited out in the open waters of the ocean. I have something for you to think about. Now, this is fun. Think about how much mud or shale was deposited in this great seaway. How thick could that be? Have you got a thought? Well, I'm going to show you about one-fourth, one-fourth of the mud that was deposited out in that seaway. Let's take a look. This is the first time I've hiked up to the base of this mountain of shale named Factory Butte, and it certainly has made an impression on me. How many fish, ammonites, giant plesiosaurs, and other animals lived out their lives in this seaway? How long did it take to deposit such huge thicknesses of mud? Isn't it interesting that eroded shales would be inspiring to view and photograph? In this region, this sequence is named the Manco Shale. We are seeing about 1,200 feet of it here. To a Ron Blakey map here, about 92 million years ago. Uh, the state of Utah is right in here. Uh, I'm standing about right here, only about 35 miles from the shoreline here, this ancient shoreline. This is the seaway at its maxim maximum extent. It was over 600 miles wide, 2,000 plus miles long. Uh, the water in here was uh, relatively shallow, 2,500 feet to 3,000 feet or so. Uh, that's, those are the estimates. This seaway formed from the early uplift of the Rocky Mountains. The Rocky Mountains developed in, in two major phases. The early phase was the severe orogeny, which we see the mountains here. We don't yet see the Great Rockies in, the Colorado, uh, in Colorado or say my favorite, the Bighorn Mountains of Wyoming and their other mountain ranges that were to develop later. Uh, these mountains begin to uplift at about 160 million years ago or so. Uh, and that's when this seaway started to, to develop. It created this foreland basin. We refer to this as a foreland basin. And it's rather simple. As you build up all this mass on the mountains that we're showing right here from the severe orogeny, uh, it depresses the lithosphere and creates a low out in front of the mountains. And that's the Foreland Basin that develops and, and this low region where the ocean can intrude into the continent and divide North America. We've been looking at the shale here around Factory Butte. Now let's go over here to get another perspective. Only in these amazing, beautiful deserts like we have here near Capitol Reef National Monument in Utah can we see contacts like this. That is shale on shale. This dark colored shale here, sitting on this lighter colored a bit of shale here, 
and then going over here just on the other side of this lighter colored bed here there's just some salts in here to give us that color but right over here three or four feet of oysters and I mean I walked along them oh for a half a mile or so these oysters there's just tons of oysters and I love this because it tells me right where I am I know that right through this area with these oysters and everything, I'm in shallow water right close to the, sh uh, the shoreline. Whereas this dark shale, now this is a different story. This represents an influx of deep water. Geologically, this happens a lot where it seems to be rather sodden, and it is geologically in geologic time, to bring in deep water right over the top of this. And this, by the way, this dark shale, this is the base of the deep waters that intruded and formed that great Cretaceous Seaway. I love walking along here, along this contact here, with my dark shales here and my lighter ones here, and, and knowing that this is the event. This is where this occurred in geologic space, the opening of the seaway. Lots of fun. The base of the Manco Shale is here, and this section is what we saw earlier at Factory Butte. The total thickness from the base to this sandstone layer is about 2,300 feet. That's a lot of shale. But believe it or not, we are missing another 700 feet of shale that was eroded off the top of the sandstone layer. Amazing, isn't it? The gray colors we see are from the Manco Shale in the area that we've been investigating. Now that we've explored this region, let's look along the world's longest continuous escarpment at 250 miles. At the western end of the escarpment is a small community named Helper, Utah. And this is what we see here. The upper thousand feet of the Manco Shale. Quite impressive. Note the homes for scale. But it's even more impressive if we can see what's underground. It turns out that there's about 4,000 feet more of this shale buried under the ground here that's not revealed. I also want to point out that there are several layers of sandstone throughout the upper half of this exposure. It's quite sandy at the top. Moving to the southeast about 50 miles near the community of Green River, Utah, we get a nice view of this great escarpment. The shaley section we see here is about a thousand feet thick, and there's another three thousand feet buried underneath the ground. Note that here, as in the last location we were at, there are significant layers of sandstone in the upper parts. We'll discuss these sandstone layers later. Moving along eastward, we get great views of this mighty escarpment stretching into the distance. The many canyons cut into this escarpment form these protruding fingers. Looking more closely in this area, I see one significant change. What do you notice? There are several differences you might observe here, but the one I want to point out is the distribution of sandstone layers. Note that there is one large sandstone layer capping the shale slopes and that the slopes have no sandstone beds within them. Let's continue to the easternmost exposure of the Book Cliffs near Grand Junction, Colorado. What a spectacular exposure. It's about 1,700 feet thick and there's an additional 2,300 feet or so of shale below ground making the total shale thickness about 4,000 feet. As we saw at the last location, the only significant sandstone layer is the one capping the shale sequence. We've established that there is a massive sequence of shale in these two regions, but these observations don't prove that there was a seaway that divided North America. Geologists continued to gather information and to steadily build a clear picture of the extent of these shales. Another region that provided much insight was northwest Wyoming. I'm walking down a great band of shale that stretches off into the distance. 
Whenever I'm hiking through geology, I try to visualize the way the landscape looked long ago, or how the rock layers were before erosion, or how they appear underground. In this area, the great layers of rock are dipping about 30 degrees and plunge deep into the earth, whereas the layers in Utah were relatively flat. In this area, the layers of rock were deformed into great folds during the Laramide orogeny and then subsequently eroded down into their present configuration. You may be curious about these white flat irons. You can learn more about them by watching a video I did entitled, Discover the Origin of a Beautiful Rock Formation. Well, it's sure nice to be back in the big, wide open spaces of Wyoming. Northwestern Wyoming, God's country. It's where I'm from, so of course I call it God's country. Uh, we're near a community named Lovell, and we're on top of the same shale that we were looking at some 400 miles away in Utah. So here we have my handy stratigraphic column uh, with the Cody Shale right here, and I'm showing it at about 3,000 feet thick. Of course, it's variable, but it's thick, 3,000 feet here. And uh, of course, it's Cretaceous age, like we've seen. Now. Another, uh, I'll just mention here, that even out here in the dry areas of Wyoming, it can have quite a bit of vegetation. So it's not real obvious. It's not a beautiful dark shale that you see everywhere because of the vegetation. And as you might imagine, as you go further north into uh, Canada or in other parts of the United States, it can be heavily vegetated and very hard to identify. I want to throw my hammer into it. Just hit into it a little. Boy, it's soft. You know, I just dropped the hammer and it goes all the way down. Nice dark gray. Here it's a little muddy, a little moisture in it. So there we have the Cody Shale. I know there are a lot of you out there that are asking a critical question. And I wish you could be right here with me to ask that question and we could discuss it in person, but it's gonna have to do here in video. And that question is, Myron, how do you know that's the same shale? I mean, we're talking 400 miles. 400 miles and you're, you're, you feel it's the, the same shale? And furthermore, Myron, you're claiming that geologists can track this same shale clear up into Canada and clear down to the Gulf of Mexico. That's quite a wild claim. I'm not so sure about that. You know, that's a great question and you should be thinking that way. And you should be asking geologists that very question. And I want to respond to that and tell you that in this case, there are many tools that geologists use and procedures and things that they can do. But in this particular case, I want to focus on two of them. The first is the simple one to kind of get your head around, and that is just physically tracking it. We're fortunate enough here in the West that the exposures are good and that we can literally physically track the shale. Uh, yes, there are going to be some gaps because it's covered or buried or whatever, uh, <clears throat> or heavily vegetated. Uh, but for the most part, you can track an awful lot of it just physically. But there's another really neat tool. There's some cool tools out there that we can use. And, the, and one of my favorites is a tool that's sitting right in my back pocket and it's not an iPhone. Let me show you what I have. Oh, yeah. I'll bet you know what this is. This is a very nice ammonite. Beautiful mother of pearl on it, uh, and the chambers within it. Wow. It turns out that these ammonites the chambers, the shapes of them, and how they're put together change through time. And you can use ammonites to date rocks precisely. Well, let me back up. Actually, you don't use them to date the, the sediments. Now, I know many of you are familiar with, oh yeah, you use fossils to date rocks. Well, that's kind of true, but technically it's not. So I'm going to go to the whiteboard and we're going to discuss how these wonderful ammonites are used to help us out in the Cretaceous, especially in these shales, these Cretaceous shales. Well, this is a cross-sectional view. So to make that clear, I'm going to put my fancy tree, right? I'll put a nice little tree here, right here. Of course, this is not to scale. 
And this represents a very wide area, this cross section, with a big gap. So first of all, the shale that we're interested in is this layer of rock here and here. And then there's this big gap that I've put in here. This could be 400 miles across, so just so you get a, a, a mental picture. Uh, and then over here, I've put some red lines within that shale. Those red lines are, is, are come from volcanic ash. So let me put a volcano up here. I'll just put one right here and put some smoke coming out of it. So we have a volcano that was active during the deposition. When this ocean was in place, volcanoes would go off in the region and ash would come falling down into the water and collect as a layer of volcanic ash. And I'm going to put it over on this side, but not over here. No volcanic ash over here. And here we have these red lines representing that volcanic ash. That is what we date. We take samples of volcanic ash. There are other things we date, but in, in most of the time when you're looking at sedimentary rocks, we use volcanic ash. And we date that. We don't date the fossils. Isn't that interesting? So we date it, and we have some dates on these volcanic ashes within the shale in this case. You know what else is mixed within there? Those ammonites. Yep. So let's think about this. We have ammonites scattered about, I'll put these little red dots, all through this shale. And they're over here, by the way. And now we put, geologists use a very simple method. They put two and two together. They say, okay, I know the age of the ash, and I have a, an ammonite over here by this ash bed, and it has these chambers that look this particular way. And these ammonites, they change pretty quickly through time. They evolve up through time from the bottom to the top. And so a geologist and a paleontologist will come in here and they go, oh, right by that ash bed, ammonites look like this. And then up by this ash bed, they've changed and they look like this, etc., etc. And there is a lot of field work and many geologists involved over huge areas that find ash beds and then they tie it back to the fossils that are there and then the kind of the magic occurs. Now, you don't want to date ash everywhere you go and you may not have ash. So over here in this case, we don't have any ash, but we do have fossils, don't we? So they come over here and they find a fossil here and they go, ah, I know exactly that fossil. It looks just like the fossil right over here by this volcanic ash, and I know a very close date. So isn't that interesting? Fossils aren't used to date things. They kind of are. They're really used to correlate. Correlation of time, not the actual dating. It's a subtlety, but I think important to understand this process. And that's how fossils all through the geologic record, or a large part of it anyway, can be used to correlate really around the world in many cases, these fossils, and, and know the date that you're dealing with. We've been able to visit three areas and set our eyes on the shales deposited in the Cretaceous Seaway. There are many other locations where one can walk on the shales. But one of the most important data sets used to help build the picture of this seaway comes from thousands of wells scattered all through the seaway. Special tools are lowered into the wells to detect various properties of the rock formations, such as natural gamma radiation. The various readings clearly show the deposits within the seaway and can easily be correlated from one well to another, creating a clear picture of the underground formations. We've learned a lot about this seaway, but what does it have to do with these spectacular ruins? How is it the key to the success of Buffalo? And of course, one has to wonder what happened to the seaway. Why isn't it here now? It wasn't just shale that was deposited in the seaway. Sandstone, coal, and even some limestones were deposited. Let's focus on the sandstone and start by returning to Factory Butte and examine the sandstone formation that caps it. 
pay attention to the distribution of sand. What do you notice? There are a few things I could point out, but what I want to focus on is the observation that in general this interval gets sandier towards the top and that the beds of sandstone get thicker as you go up through the section. Looking again, we see the first hints of sandstone here and here and here, etc. It becomes quite sandy in this section and then of course we see the thick sandstone bed at the top. The thick sandstones found within the Manco Shale have an interesting story to reveal to us. Let's learn more. Before we get to my sketch here, I want to discuss the natural order of geology that can occur. Now when I'm out in the field and I see a thick sequence of shale with a hefty uh, sandstone sitting on top like we've seen, I look at that and I immediately feel quite confident that I know how that sandstone was deposited, the depositional environment that deposited that sandstone. And I think with this discussion on the whiteboard, you'll understand why I look at it that way. I have a cross-sectional view here with the severe mountains that build up, a great mass that had built up in their formation, depressing the lithosphere, uh, forming this low area, the Foreland Basin. The dark colored layers here are the layers that existed before deformation occurred, uh, so they got deformed. Uh, the blue here, of course, is sea level. I've even got a couple fancy little fish in there to represent the sea. We have these red layers, which are simply uh, depicting sediments that have begun to fill in the seaway uh, in, in, through time. The seaway was active from about 105, or present, I should say, from about 105 to 65 million years ago. That's a period of 40 million years, a good long period. Let's talk about the sedimentation that's occurring within the seaway. Uh, the first process we have is pelagic rain. Those are clay-sized particles. Clay, think of it as dust in the ocean water settling out that gets way out in the open ocean. Much of the, much of the uh, shale that we saw was from pelagic rain. Now, as you move in closer to the shoreline, which in this case we have the shoreline right here, you get higher energy and it's transporting larger particles such as sand uh, that we see in, within the section. And you can have uh, processes like beach deposits and deltas and things in, in closer to here and closer to the mountain, of course. So now the fun part. We get to imagine what the world looks like through time here in this Cretaceous Seaway as sediment is being deposited. Let's start with the beach. Make it simple shallow water deposits right along the seashore. And that is, in this sketch, as we know, it would be right here. That's where the beach is right now. Now, as this system fills in through time, that beach is going to work its way to the east, in this case, the actual Cretaceous Seaway. Let me draw that in. So I'll put another sequence of sediment going out like that, like the prior ones. And as that occurs, as that builds out, that beach is moving right along, just like that. So we have a nice beach deposit that goes across to the east like this. And in fact, if you really think, you go, well, that had to have occurred back here as well. And it did prior. It was back here. And you can go further back in time yet. These are beach deposits in this area right here. And along here, they're in closer to the mountain, so we have more of them in close. And, and these got buried through time because the basin is continually subsiding. So this beach was, was at sea level, but it sunk down through time and got covered with more sediment, actually from this direction mostly, from the mountains. And, and we, but at some point it all ends. And that is this uppermost deposit, this big, thick sandstone that we see. Now, this is what we saw in the book cliffs. Right here in close, near Helper, Utah, next to the mountains, we saw quite a bit of sand right up at the upper part. And in fact, it continued uh, over to Green River, where we saw a lot of sand sequences. And then, as you got to the Grand Junction, you only had one. And it was this uppermost one that was working its way as the complete system filled in. 
And there, all you have is the big upper sandstone sitting on the sequence of shale. So now you know why when I see a big sandstone sitting on top of shale, I think to myself, and I think of this process, and I think that sandstone was deposited near shore, close to the beach. We'll just say beach for the moment. And here's another interesting thing about all this, is this big upper sandstone that stretches way out across the seaway, it's named the Mesa Verde Formation or the Mesa Verde Group. It depends where you're at. And I'll bet most of you know where that name comes from. The Mesa Verde Ruins. Yeah, th those spectacular ruins are built within this sandstone sequence, this final capping sandstone uh, on top of this shale. Pretty interesting, huh? I do want to say that this is the case most of the time. You can have sandstones on top of shale or within shale that aren't shallow water, but that's another discussion. And I also want to add that these aren't the only types of deposits within this Cretaceous Seaway, these sandy beaches and mud. Let's go look at another type of deposit in Wyoming. Back in Wyoming again. Yeah, it's in an area out here in the desert that isn't particularly interesting. Uh, lots of sagebrush, just desert. Uh, a ridge here over here that's not overly interesting, but I'm sure excited to show you this location. It's one of those places that most people, if they hike through or nearby, they wouldn't think much of it at all. They'd say, ah, oh, kind of interesting. But I'm telling you, it's a world-class geologic outcrop. <clears throat> and what makes it even better is I found it on my own, just stumbled onto it. It may be out there in the literature or something, I haven't seen it. So it makes it even funner for me. Now, as we come along, we're gonna make a few observations so we understand the bigger picture as we develop uh, the concepts and explore ideas together. This'll be fun. The first thing that I notice here as I'm hiking through these outcrops is the structural dip or tilt of the beds. These are tilted up like 70 degrees, nearly vertical. And remember, they were all deposited essentially horizontal and now have been uplifted and tilted. And this helps us interpret uh, the rock as we hike around and observe these outcrops. Also, I notice these thin, platy, coaly layers. I call them coaly. They're not cold, but they're close. That certainly gives us some information to think about. The wonderful geologic landscape I'm entering is absolutely mesmerizing to me. Hmm, an interesting pillar of sandstone. Stop right here. I know many of you will wonder what all the sticks are about I'm standing on. If you look closely near the top of the sandstone column, you'll see remnants of a golden eagle nest. There have been generations of nests built here. From above, one gets the impression that there are sandstone bodies of various sizes and shapes poking up from the ground. The band of these features stretching off into the distance is about 1,200 feet wide. I just really enjoy walking around looking at these. Looking at the rock closely, I see that it's a fine to medium grain sandstone with lots of rock fragments in it. Uh, two of them stacked together here, one right on top of the other. Very small one poking right up out of the mud right here. And I've seen them even smaller than this one. Very classic cross bedding. The 
the thin layers within it look like crust bedding. This one feels more tabular to me. It's, it's wider and thinner. There's a gap here between these two little points, but I think in reality it's all one uh, body, one tabular body. The more you look, the more you see. There are sure a lot of them. What a lot of fun, hiking around, looking at these, seeing them from, with the drone. Uh, this is the third time and I'm, I haven't been disappointed. I could spend days out here, I think, just hiking all through this region and just seeing one after another. Some of these pillars, uh, that's kind of more or less what they look like, pillars. Now, some of them are wider and have a tabular shape. But to understand this, we need to go back to some of our observations. On the hike in, the first thing we need to remember is the structural dip of these. They're dipping very steeply, nearly vertical, the, the layers that these pillars are within. Number two, we saw some coal. Now coal tells us some things. I want you to think about that. We'll come back to that. What does it tell us to help us here? And then as we've hiked around here and made these observations, just the general shapes, they're composed of sandstone, uh, fine grain to medium grain sandstone. We've seen cross bedding sedimentary structures. And without going into a lot of detail, that just means sand uh, that's deposited in, current, in ener energetic currents. It can be the wind or water. And they make these nice laminations that have uh, differing dips and th often thin layers. Beautiful to behold, this cross bedding. And so, wind, okay, sand dunes, we can think about that. Water, where do we get energetic water? Well, we see it on the beaches, we see it in tidal channels, we see it in rivers. Those are some of the few that come to mind. So these are the things that you think about as you're walking out through this landscape trying to figure out what are we witnessing. Two parts to my sketch here. Uh, I want to focus on this part first. It's a cross-sectional view and therefore I have my handy little tree here. What I've tried to do here is using these red uh, smiley faces, these little smileys, they represent the sand bodies that we've been observing. Now we've been walking around, remember, on things that are standing vertical. So these layers are dipping vertical and we're walking across the top looking down. Very fascinating perspective, isn't it? Now I've just turned it all sideways so we can look here and think about it that way, before it was deformed. So these are the, uh, the sandstone bodies. And what are they encased in? Well, we have differential erosion, meaning the soft material around these sandstone bodies is eroding more quickly, leaving them in relief like we've seen, these wonderful pillars. And that suggests, and if you look at it carefully, it's obviously a mudstone. Uh, so that tells us something, doesn't it? We have sandstone encased in mudstone. So at the high level, that's what we're seeing. Now let's move over to this perspective view. It's not quite looking straight down. It's kind of looking at an angle in towards the mountains, the severe mountains. And here's this great Cretaceous seaway here with blue, and I've put some waves in here to make it really nice. <laughs> And here is a very flat, low-lying area referred to as the coastal plain. Now, why would I say there's a flat, low-lying area there? Let's think about our observations. We saw some coal. And coal is very common in delta environments in the swamps around deltas or very uh, low-relief coastal plains where you have the swamps way back in from the coastline. That's where coals are common. So this is giving us more and more information. We can start to paint this picture. Mountains we know about, coastal plain with the beach right along the shoreline. We've seen the beach deposits. Now we're seeing something else. What could it be? Well, I am missing something on my sketch here. I'm sure I'm missing a few things, but we have a mountain range here. We know that rivers come out of mountains. Wouldn't they be coming down off the mountains towards the shoreline? Yeah. 
But when we think of rivers, we think of them uh, getting bigger and bigger as they come down. So there's a river here that's small out of the mountain. It comes out and more and more tributaries join it and it gets bigger and bigger. And by the time it gets to the shoreline, it's a pretty good sized river, but uh, we're not seeing that. We're seeing, we're seeing relatively small channels everywhere, just everywhere, both horizontally, laterally, and in depth. So uh, this is kind of hard to figure out. And then you start thinking about topography and really flat-lying surfaces, flat-lying terrain like deltas and like coastal plains. And when the rivers get there, they start branching the reverse way and, and create distributary channels. They're called distributary channels because they distribute sediment out. Once they hit flats, they start switching all around and building them. Let me sketch that in. So a big river comes out of, out of the mountains, and, and I'll put another one over here and maybe one here. Uh, many miles apart, right? Because they're coalescing and collecting into these big rivers. And But once they get to the coastal plain, instead of tributaries coming in like this and feeding into these rivers like so, they flip around and they start branching out like this. Very common on deltas and coastal plains. Lots and lots of them. Each one doing the same thing, branching out and out, and these, and it keeps going to a very small scale. The mighty Yukon River of Alaska is a great example of this process. Zooming in, we see the very large number of distributary channels building the delta. Now, does that make sense? I think it does. What are we, we're seeing that very thing. We're seeing tons, and I've seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these walking around. It's fun. And it's these distributary channels. I think so. And we have coal. That helps us build confidence. We have coal. Uh, we have these small little channels all over, way out away from the mountains. Hey, I think we've got a winning idea here. I'm running out of light, but I just can't help it. I decide to wander through this landscape one more time and reflect on the seaway, on the remnants of beautifully eroded shale and the time they represent in their deposition, burial, and erosion. The time involved just on the deposition of the shale is hard for me to fathom. Only about one quarter of an inch per hundred years was deposited. I think about the life of this great seaway coming to an end after 40 million years of existence and that the channels scattered all about me are evidence of that. Yet the filling of this great depression in the earth with sediment brought about the vast great plains, the buffalo, and diverse life that thrived therein. I hope you enjoyed watching this video, and would you consider subscribing to my channel? Thank you.